This may be the, the most critical public health crisis in American history right now. And there are people like me and a few thousand other people in the midst of all this, what we're most worried about is, are we going to have an election in November? That's what we're worried about. And we're working hard to deal with that fact. At the other end, there are people who are focused on the health crisis and its implications. And sometime at the end of October, they're going to realize there's an election coming up. And how are we going to get those people to know what to do? In, in these circumstances, either to get a mail ballot or how to deal with the fact that a local precinct might be closed. And election officials can mail all the postcards they want and do as many you know, ads on Facebook or whatever. But ultimately, I think that the campaigns are going to have a big role because they are not constrained like election officials in communicating with voters. From the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State University, recording from remote locations throughout State College, I'm Michael Berkman. And I'm Chris Beam. I'm Jenna Spinelli, and welcome to Democracy Works. Today, guys, we are going to talk about what elections look like amid COVID-19. And joining us today for the conversation is Charles Stewart, the Keenan Sahin Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT. Charles has been quite busy these days uh, writing on this topic in Lawfare and, and a host of other places. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. And I think it's a nice kind of segue or a nice follow up to some of the things we talked about last week. Yeah, I agree, Jenna. Last week, we were talking about how democracies and authoritarian governments uh, respond differently to uh, a global pandemic. Today, we're kind of flipping that around a little bit and talking about how the global pandemic affects our democracy. Our guests can talk about elections, and Chris and I should talk about that a little bit too. But, but Chris, this involves other issues as well, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, a democracy is about people coming together to make decisions. Hey, and we should how call do you it do democracy that? works. Right. And how do you do that when people can't <laughs> come together? You know, and, I mean, basically, it's just that simple. This is a an incredible logistical problem. And yeah, it goes think, to the core of, of, of how a democracy works. Yeah, I think we're really feeling it in a couple of ways acutely right now. One is that we're in the middle of a primary campaign, but states have canceled their primaries. Uh, another is that Congress is trying to come up with a uh, very large uh, rescue package, while at the same time, coronavirus is spreading around the Senate and potentially the House as well. And states who are on the front lines of everything that's going on, many of them are unable to even meet in their legislatures right now. Right. So all, th all of those, all of those things you mentioned are um, one form or another of voting, right? It's each individual saying, I, I choose this person or that person, or I, I vote yay or nay. Yeah, and, it is. What are the mechanisms? But the other thing that I've been thinking about, and I'll be uh, interested to talk with Charles about this, going back to what you were saying about about the states in particular, you know, it's it's going to be on them to figure out how to make all that this election stuff work in November, whether it's voting by mail or, you know, other other alternatives. But, you know, there are also states are also dealing with businesses that are closed, hospitals that are getting increasingly full, schools that are closed, you know, any any number of things. I got to imagine if you're a state or county or, or city official, the election is not super high on your priority list right now. Well, I'd go even a step beyond that. Remember that states, for the most part, can't run budget deficits. So while we have a massive spending bill going through the Senate right now that Nobody is really paying any attention to how where the money will come from for this because we're in a national crisis. States can't do that, so they are they are waiting for money from the federal government. They are also the front lines, and I think this is you know we we spend a lot of attention. The country is kind of focused on the White House and the White House briefings, and uh, the president talks about opening everything up by Easter, but in reality. You know, public health is largely a state responsibility. It's been state governors that have shut everything down. I mean, here in Pennsylvania, it was Governor Wolf who shut everything down. 
states have a lot they need to be doing right now, but the state legislatures in multiple states right now are shut down because of uh, the coronavirus. Right. And it's also some number of, of senators and, and House members are themselves up for re-election in November. So that's something else that they have to be thinking about. How can they, in terms of their campaigns, get ready to make the change from voting in person to voting by mail or you know whatever else ends up happening? Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you raised that, Jenna, because the election really raises two issues. One is, how do you have an election if you can't vote? And so... Voting by mail seems to be a way of of addressing this, uh, but there's reluctance to do that because if you open up voting by mail, then that will probably, I mean, if you mandate voting by mail coming from the federal government, then that will likely persist after this election. But you also have the issue of how do you have a campaign? I mean, democracy is very much about people coming together. They have and, to come together, right? They and have campaigns. To vote. Right. And campaigns are collective activities and protest right. is a collective activity. And we're all practicing isolation. Well, that might make a great topic for a future future episode, the future of, of campaigns and how we all kind of collectively come together in a democracy in this time of social distancing. But you know, I think that we have laid the table for some of the issues at stake regarding elections and voting and what that is all going to mean uh, in, in light of COVID-19. So let's go now to my interview with Charles Stewart. This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Charles Stewart. Charles, thanks for joining us on Democracy Works. Oh, it's great to be here. So we are going to talk today all about elections and COVID-19 and where we kind of go from here. It's becoming very obvious that uh, having large groups of people standing in close proximity for hours at a time on, on election day is not going to be a good idea come November. You are someone who has spent a lot of time recently and and perhaps before that uh, thinking about what some alternative scenarios might look like. So I'd like to start maybe with like your best case scenario here of, you know, what an ideal remote voting situation would look like this fall. uh, And then we can maybe back up and and talk about about how we get there and and all those kind of things. Um, So I'll, I'll... I'll start by undercutting the premise a little bit in in the sense that I don't think there's one perfect way of doing it. And I say that because what I've discovered in my research is that voters have different ideas about what constitutes a properly run election. And I think that that's the other dimension we need to be concerned about. And, you know, we were already concerned about voter confidence in 2020, and I think we have to do as much as we can to maintain voter confidence. And cer- certainly part of that is going to be um, dealing with the health emergency, but part of it is also going to be what does the election look like from the perspective of voters who expect it to look like something, Right. So it's going to be easy in Oregon, Washington, Colorado. In fact, they're already there because they're already voting by mail. But there's actually more in-person interaction in those states than you think. Most voters in those states return those ballots in person, um, either at a, at a drop box or a vote center. And then about something like five to 10 percent of the voters in Colorado nonetheless go to a vote center to vote in person. But that's, you know, if all you cared about was public health and you were used to voting by mail, that would seem to be the ideal solution in in those places. Mm -hmm. And so they're pretty much there. But there are lots of other states that are not in that place at all. I mean, I know Pennsylvania, where we all are just this year, increased its, its vote by mail capacity. But there are others that are lagging even further behind where, where we are right now. So outside of those, those right. states you mentioned, um, what, what's the, the landscape look like? Well, but I, and I think actually Pennsylvania is a, is a case I've been thinking a lot about. I was already thinking a lot about it before um, COVID-19 because Pennsylvania and Michigan are two battleground states where they've just gone to a regime where you no longer need an excuse. And so to, to vote by mail. Um, the first time you vote, you look the excuse, you don't know what you're going to get. 
but history would have told us that a, a state like Pennsylvania would go for some, from something like 5% mail ballots to maybe 15, 20 if you're lucky, more likely 15 the first time. Because um, voters, you know, again, um, status quo bias. Voters vote like they've always voted. So the best of all possible worlds for a state like Pennsylvania would be the following in my view. First of all, do what you can to increase number of people voting by mail and plan for more than that, right? <laughs> um, because you just don't know what, how people are going to respond. And don't, well, and then here's the tricky thing. I think what you have to try to do is keep as many in-person um, in precincts open as you can. There's going to be a strong push to close precincts, both because you're trying to depopulate them, and secondly, because you're going to have a hard time getting um, election workers to staff them and understand that. On the other hand, you are going to have some set of people, I think in a, I, if I were a betting person, I would bet that at least half of the voters in Pennsylvania will nonetheless vote on election day in 2020. In which case you're going to need the, the polling places. You're going to need for a lot of social distancing. You know, you're going to need that capacity. Do you think that that states have or will have the capacity to be able to do that? I mean, thinking about, you know, they're also dealing with schools that are closed and economic impact and public health issues and, 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 and all sorts of things. It, you know, I, I wonder where some of these like election issues fall on the scale of, of things that state and, and, and local officials are, are worrying about right now. Well, here's the thing. Right now, um, state and local officials are worrying about a variety of things. I mean, it's my sense that in the places where the elections are coming up, as we saw, say, in Ohio, you know, the governor's paying attention um, when it comes to election day. So people are paying attention to elections when they have to. And I can also say that right now, everybody in the election space, <laughs> including you know academics and activists and election officials, all the way up and down the totem pole are thinking about what to do. And so I'm not, wor I'm not too worried about people, whether they're gonna think this thing through. And you know, at the end of the day, I'm not as worried as some about the resources for the following reason. The, the hardest resource is gonna be people. To staff the polling places, to count the ballots, to, to do those sorts of things. If you don't have enough people, the worst that happens, and it's not a good thing, but I think the worst thing that happens is that you have delays. You have long lines, it takes longer to count the ballots, those sorts of things. So the kind of plan B and a half is to secure places where you usually don't have people hanging around for a long, long time. This change in, in approach, you know, regardless of, of how big it might be from one state to the next, there, I, it seems like there might also be some, some security issues that, that are, are raised here that would not have necessarily been the case if, if voting is primarily happening in person. What are some of those security concerns that, that come along with shifting to a, something that's more heavily focused on voting by mail? So the big, a big security concern to vote by mail derived from the fact that you lose, um, lose control over the chain of custody of the ballot, um, particularly when it's in the, in the voter's home, which is actually, I think, the, big, the biggest problem. Maybe your spouse is taking your ballot and marked it for you and sent it back without you knowing it ever came. Maybe the ballot for your kid who's off at college has arrived, you vote it and vote it and send it back. Maybe for the, the person who owned the house before you who has died and you know somebody requested a, a, a mail ballot for them, maybe you do that. So, um, I mean, these are fanciful. I mean, you know, we know that in person, um, it kind of voter impersonation is rare as is as is mail ballot fraud, but among the, the flavors of voting fraud, the least rare, we put it that way, mm -hmm. the least rare um, involves um, voting by mail, um, where you know, precisely people take advantage of, of a number of these features. Now, there are ways of, uh, there are ways of mitigating. Um, so, so let's get outside of the home, and let's think about um, you know, the, the process of transmitting the ballots. In a state like Oregon or, or Colorado, as a voter, 
you can go onto a website and you can see, oh, they've mailed my ballot. Um, I have my ballot, I mark it, oh, I put it in the mail, oh, look, it's arrived at the county office, and oh, look, they opened it up and they accepted it, and um, they're counting it. Um, we can pretty much guarantee that the states that are going to ramp up um, mail voting this time are not going to have those services. And so secured, a lot of election security depends on many eyes watching the process. And, you know, in these states, it's going to be harder. When, when it's 5% of ballots, you don't worry so much about it. When it's 3 or 40% of ballots, then you start to worry about this. Yeah. And of course, you know, any brand new process or even sort of new process, there's always, you know, errors and kind of roadblocks and things that you didn't anticipate. So we're going to probably see all those things play out perhaps, but in a, in a situation where there's no time to go back and redo it, or you really only get one shot at it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Ab- absolutely. There's no do-overs. There's no, no November 3rd has got to happen. Thing number two, um, you know, I was, um, you know, just on a, on a, on a call with the, election director in Oregon, and he's obviously getting a, getting a lot of attention these days. And every, every time he's interviewed or does a press appearance or something, he makes the point that, you know, in Oregon, they've been doing vote by mail for 20 years. And every time they do it, they learn something new. And, um, you know, say with Washington and Colorado, and these are all works in progress. And you can be guaranteed that in the states that are ramping up for the first time, there's going to be a lot more questions, a lot more um, snafus, and you know we're going to have to. Um, I don't want to quite say accept it, but we have to plan for it. Yeah, and and the the hope would be then that that states that are newer can learn from Oregon and Colorado and and Washington about what you know to to, to try to avoid making some of the same mistakes that they've already had, or they can kind of learn from what they've done. Yeah, they can to some degree, and and and, and certainly the, the election directors in the states um, have already reached out, and they have all sorts of emails and the twenty things you know we wish we had known when we started doing this that they're they're mailing around. So so there's a lot you know there's a lot of experience um, among the election administrators about how to do this. The the thing though, and this is where um, this is where the heterogeneity of American federalism comes in. Oregon, Washington, Colorado's experience only goes so far. And, you know, ultimately Pennsylvania and New Jersey and, you know, they're going to have to figure it out on their own and actually might learn more from each other than they might learn from Western states that have been, had, you know, they've had great distances. They've been, I mean, you know, great physical distances in the West. They've been voting by mail for a long time. They have a strong progressive um, political tradition in both the Democratic and Republican parties. And so you have a number of things there that make it, I think, easier to settle into voting by mail than um, those of us on the East Coast and the Northeast will. Yeah. So for for states that are coming into this newer in in their their process, what's what's the timeline? Like when do they need to be you know realistically getting ballots printed and into envelopes and kind of out the door to people to have some you know some reasonable count on or perhaps shortly there thereafter November third. Well, um, because of a well, because of a federal law called um, UACAVA, and I won't reproduce the um, what the acronym means, but it's basically the law that governs the governs the distribution of ballots to overseas civilian and military voters. Because of that, ballots basically have to be mailed out for the November election by mid September. So you know, kind of thinking back. In some ways, you know, you don't have to, you know, go, no, go is sometime middle of September, but then, you know, moving back up, up the decision tree, you need to pro- procure vendors, you need to get, you know, the one remaining high-speed scanner that's left in America, you need to do all those things. And honestly, you know, that's happening right now. I mean, I, I've, as I talk to legis- you know, kind of state people, legislators and, 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 and election officials, they're saying, you know, there's a bunch of decisions we need to make um, in the next month at the most. And that will drive procurement and, and other things to get prepared then for things that just start to go at a, at a, at a great pace. Yeah, that's super helpful thinking about that, that, that timeline and that brought up a couple of things to, to follow up on. 
voter suppression, voter access type of issues, what yeah. what hurdles are we we looking at there with the, the vote by mail approach? Well, I mean, it, you know, it, it depends on on how you approach it, but but I think I. I start with, so there, there, I think there are two topics that come up. The first one is that there may be um, communities that are distrustful of the males. Um, and so that an emphasis on, on, on vote by mail may disadvantage those groups. Furthermore, um, um, people who live in those communities oftentimes have the hardest time recruiting poll workers um, as well. So I think yeah, underserved communities um, are going to be tough. Similarly, people who don't have permanent addresses for whatever reason, on the, the, the dip, most difficult case, people, you know, homeless people, you know, so there's going to be, you know, some, some set of people who are going to need to vote in person. And um, I think everyone in the business understands that there has to be um, continued um, voting in person. And one of those reasons is you have populations who don't want them just, just for good reasons or bad reasons, just don't want to vote by mail. And there are going to be other people who kind of need, you know, some sort of face-to-face, person-to-person assistance. On top of all this, I, I'd say that, I mean, this isn't exactly in the area of voter suppression, but it's in facilitating early, I mean, younger voters and people who've noted, never voted before. The research suggests that um, the first time voters are much, much more likely to vote in person and they don't know how to navigate the process. So, you know, I, um, so the more you make people do, the harder it's going to be. And the more options you give people to overcome those burdens, the easier it's going to be for those people, to, people to vote. So you have to, you have to plan all that out. Right. What role do the campaigns play here in, in encouraging people to, to vote by mail? Yeah, so you're, so you're reading my mind, and I, I think that well, and, and I think that 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 becomes you know that becomes um, a, an important thing for reaching new voters, underserved voters, um, and 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 the rest is that this is the, the this may be the most critical public health crisis in American history right now, and there are people like me and a few thousand other people in the midst of all this. What we're most worried about is are we going to have an election in November? That's what we're worried about. And we're working hard to, 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 um, to deal with that fact. At the other end, there are people who are, ups- I mean, who are focused on the health crisis and its r- implications. And sometime at the end of October, they're going to realize there's an election coming up. And, you know, these, I mean, you, can, you can tell all sorts of stories about who these folks are, but they are not high propensity voters. Um, and how are we going to get those people um, to know what to do? In, in these circumstances, either to get a mail ballot or how to deal with the fact that a local precinct might be closed. And, you know, po- election officials can mail all the postcards they want and do as many you know, ads on Facebook or whatever, whatever. But ultimately, I think that the, the campaigns are going to have a big role um, because they are not constrained like election officials in communicating with voters. And then in this, in this day and age where we can pinpoint, um, communicate with voters, you know, the campaigns also will know, you know who's received the application, who hasn't. They can target voters who need to get messages. So I, th- I think actually the campaigns will be enormously critical in this, in this season. Does that also, though, open up the door for this to become a, a more partisan or more kind of polarized issue or is that going to happen anyway? I was going to say more. Um, (laughs) Man, where have you been? Um, um, Certainly. And, you know, so right now, actually, I, I, we might be living through the worst of it right now in some ways, because for instance, you know, as we're speaking, Congress is going back and forth over the stimulus package and buried in that stimulus package is money for the election. Probably right, not 400 enough. million or something? 400 million, something million like probably not yeah. enough. Um, but some money um, for the election. And part of the, of the back and forth has been over how prescriptive, how many strings would be attached. And um, with the Democrats proposing quite a lot of strings and quite a lot of expectations and, Demo- and Republicans um, recoiling at that. And I know that um, Democrats insisting on the strings caused some Republicans to, to back off. But 
you know, if it's 400 million, if they come back with more in the future, the money will be out there. As somebody who also studies Congress, I know, you know, you're not going to get many strings for any money. So money is going to flow to the states. And there, that's where Democratic and Republican operatives and election officials, et cetera, are more agreed about what needs to be done. And so I think there's going to be less partisanship once the action moves to the states, although even there, um, Republicans have been more likely, you know, Democrats have been more likely to um, um, push making it easy to vote by mail. And so in the states where the legislature has to get involved, you're going to see variation um, depending on what the state legislative um, partisanship looks like. And, and so we've also been talking a, a kind of this this premise that the the election is happening November 3rd. I mean, is that at all negotiable? Is it within the president's power to to move something forward, to to postpone it or, or any scenario like that? No and no. Um, okay. <laughs> so next question. No. Um, um, so um, the, the election date is non-negotiable. And which, by the way, makes the quote unquote precedent set right now about primaries not really precedents um, for a lot of reasons. Um, and but has a, a number of people freaked out, especially those who think that Donald Trump's deepest desire is to call off the 2020 election. Um, it's not a good luck. But there, both statute and the Constitution constrain the date of the election. And so, so that's, that's not a, a negotiable. As to Donald Trump, he has no authority. Yeah, he has no authority to, to do anything. Governors may. And that's where, you know, the hard thinking is being done. What sort of emergency authority does a governor have? And, you know, I'm, an, I'm not an attorney. I mean, I, I've seen what the, the election lawyers, academic and non, have written about that and talked about that. There's um, good resources on the authority that governors and secretaries of state have in the election realm. By and large, that's to give greater flexibility in, in the moment of, a, of an emergency. But... I've been advocating, I mean, I think this is the right thing to do is to rather than ask, you know, can we postpone the election if I'm a governor? It's that under a worst case scenario, how do we continue voting if, you know, the asteroids start raining down on us the night of November 2nd? Or if a surge of, of the virus comes back on November 1st, how do we get the voting done? And so part of that is, well, you know, do it by mail as much as you can. That gives you more flexibility. But the task is it has to be done. And so have your social distancing protocols down, have your backups for polling places, have all that stuff ready. Um, it's a new type of contingency planning that election officials haven't done. But I, I think that that's how the next seven months are going to be spent is getting those contingency plans. Right. And, and I, I know you just said you're, you're not a lawyer, but I, I'm also just wondering about the, this, if, if a state or, or several states would, would decide to postpone or do something that, that goes off of the kind of course that everyone else is taking, does that open up the opportunity in our partisanized world for either party or, or candidates to bring legal challenges against, against results or you know, things like that? As I've been talking to lawyers, um, election lawyers um, in and outside of the academy, I think everyone is assuming, well, everyone's lawyering up and um, lawyering up in the battleground states particularly um, and are going to be ready to litigate everything. Um, and you just have to assume that. And, and which again, I mean, is unfortunate because we knew this was going to be a contended election and it just makes it even more likely even more that there's so. going to be you know, a dispute at the end. Charles, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about vote by mail and, and you know how to all the steps that that would be involved with that but is there to, to your knowledge kind of a, a parallel track thinking thinking about how to have a safer in-person voting process or are there other alternatives out there folks are thinking about I, I know that I was going to say you know, voting online but I think People are maybe kind of skittish about that after after Iowa and after Russia and all those things. But I don't know just what other what other conversations are are happening out there beyond just vote by mail. Well, I mean, certainly the online voting thing it comes up, and that would be an, an entirely you know separate 
episode on its own. What I find interesting is that there are, I mean, there are, are advocates out there around internet voting and they've kept their heads down because um, the anti-internet voting um, arguments are very strong and that's, that's obviously a no-go. So there, you're, you're to the point of making in-person voting safe. And when I'm with election officials and I make this point, um, you see the heads nodding up and down. I think that what's happening right now and what happened, say, on Super Tuesday, the, the difficult situation there, um, as one um, election official said recently from Florida, was that suddenly we became public health professionals and we're not qualified for that. And so they were put in difficult situations of not knowing how to make it safe, not being able to reassure poll workers that they could make the situation safe or even necessarily um, reassure voters. Now we have seven months to plan on that. And I think that the, I see the comprehensive plan for making in-person voting safe is first of all, de-densifying is the word, right? Sort of, you know, so that is where to make, Voting in person safe, you need to make, you know, more people vote by mail. And then, you know, I, you know, from my, my observation, it's going to involve taking what we're going to be learning as we grocery shop safely and, and, and do these other things safely, uh, where we have to be around other people in confined spaces and stand in lines. And so... You know, the things that you're seeing already is poll workers putting tape on the floor every six feet away. Maybe I'm um, having somebody at the door of a polling place letting in five, ten people at a time, something like that. So there are those practices that are certainly being going to be examined. And as we go down the road, those will be practices that we're doing everywhere we go. So they won't be, won't be really mysterious. Um, so our, our listeners are very concerned. They're very engaged. If this is something that they want to get more involved in in their state or they want to try to do what they can to help in, increase access to, to voting by mail or, or, or get this onto people's radars, uh, what, what can they do? What groups are out there working on this? What, what steps should they take? Well, in every state, you know, there's illegal women voters. Um, and um, since I, I won't... I won't go in, into it. I have a soft spot in my head for the League of Women Voters, and um, I would encourage, there's one everywhere, um, and get involved with them and see what they think you should be doing. But, but act now, um, because decisions are being made now. And then, you know, moving down toward November later on, if your health is, is up to it and it's safe to do so, I would encourage people to volunteer to be a poll worker. And um, if not a poll worker, there might be other things that one can do to be a canvasser after the fact that may put you less at risk. But, but election officials are, are looking for people to come and help. And so that could be a really valuable thing to do as well. Great. Well, uh, Charles, thank you for all the work that, that you're doing to help these states out and to help everybody uh, figure out how to, how to have uh, an, an election in November that we can all feel good about, both from a, a public health perspective and from a, a security solidarity perspective, all of those things. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, um, that was really impressive. And it, you can understand why uh, Charles is such uh, an important authority right now. Right. I yeah, mean, absolutely. Um, he, yeah. States are looking out, uh, looking to him uh, for advice and counsel. And uh, it's a good thing that, that people are thinking about this. Yeah. It reminded me of my of our interview a little bit with Dan Smith, you know, people that really know the ins and the outs of state voting laws and state voting rules. And it's important. That uh, that there be people like that, and it's it's heartening, you know, every once in a while to see that academicians actually have a substantive and meaningful role to play in society. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, what do you think of the substance of what he had to say, Chris? You know, I really, um, I thought it was uh, there was a lot of interesting themes that I think are kind of underlying this. Right. First of all, November third is going to happen. 
right? There's nothing that can be done about it. The election is going to happen. The right. president of the United States does not have the power to just cancel the election. Right. And so the question, and, and yet- At least as we understand that power. Correct. And yeah. as it stands right now, um, the election is a, a, a very serious public health risk. And, and so it's we one have that's- to think about how we engage both of those realities in a way that um, takes both things seriously and ends up with an election process that people can respect and um, have confidence in. Right? Yeah. And, and like so much with this virus that differentiates us from other countries that are trying to deal with this virus, we're a federal system. And right. so when we're talking about these challenges with the election, we're talking about the challenges with 50 different governing authorities over the election, decentralized to numerous counties and other localities who have the responsibility for carrying it out. So it's a complex affair, and it's one that can't be easily mandated uh, from the national level. They could create some incentives. It reminded me of what went on with the Iowa caucuses this year where they try to do new things. They try to count votes differently. They try to use a new app. Mm -hmm. And in a, uh, you know, in an election or a caucus, which is carried out mostly by volunteers who are used to doing things a certain way and have gotten pretty good at it, put in a lot of changes, and it's going to take a while to figure out how to do it right. Right. And that's what he's talking about here. You know, states that have voted by mail for a long time, know what they're doing, but those that don't are going to have a rough transition. Well, and and the other dimension to this, and it's one that, that Charles mentioned as well, is that there are some states where, you know, failures to um, ramp up with this new procedure is going to be a lot more problematic than others, right? So, so for example, if you know, Nebraska or District of Columbia decide to do some uh, different procedure, you know, no one's going to pay that much attention because the, the, the results in the presidential election are already established no matter what procedure they were, use. But if we're talking about swing states like Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania, and there are issues with respect to thousands, even hundreds of votes as a result of some new procedure that somebody screwed up, um, the, the implications for people's feelings of legitimacy with respect to the results um, is, is really uh, scary and, yeah. and really um, potentially dangerous. Uh, Charles said that as a result of this, you know, of uh, the dangers associated with um, polling places as, you know, public meeting places, it might be a good idea to uh, consider making it, uh, making uh, November 3rd a public holiday. Well, sure. But it's been a good idea to consider making November 3rd a public holiday for lots of reasons right. over many years. You know, it will be an interesting test, I think, because if you can't get a voting holiday or national vote by mail or something passed under these circumstances, it's not going to happen under the present political configuration. No, I, I completely agree with that. But I also think that this that what Charles is is offering here is an example of, um, you know, a creative response to be thinking, you know, all right, here are the parameters. We have so much so many months to deal with this. How are we how are we going to do it in a way that achieves both of these completely uh, essential objectives? public health and a fair, uh, fair and legitimate election. Yeah. And well, so, I mean, that's one example. I don't, you know, but, um, but yeah, there's no, there's no naysaying that this is a politically speaking, probably the worst possible climate in which to try to achieve these kind of objectives. Well, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, you, events like this change people. And uh, maybe people will be more open and more eager to protect their elections than we've seen in the past. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are people who are honest, decent Democrats, small D, 
who are, are addressing this problem and thinking um, carefully about it. And, you know, some of them are going to come up with some really good solutions. So uh, when we when we hear those, we'll definitely um, bring them on and give them the the uh, spotlight that they deserve. Yeah. Well, this is a theme we'll return to because there's no doubt that what's going on right now will have some long lasting effects on our democracy. Absolutely. And, all right. All well, right. Why don't we rack it up? Uh, I'm Michael Berkman. I'm Chris Beam. Thanks for listening. Democracy Works is produced by the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State and WPSU Penn State, Central Pennsylvania's NPR station. Episodes are engineered by Andy Grant and Craig Johnson, edited by Chris Kugler, Jen Bortz, and Mark Stitzer, and reviewed by Emily Reddy. Our interns this semester are Nicole Grayson and Stephanie Crane, two seniors in the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications at Penn State. Democracy Works is part of the Democracy Group, a network of podcasts all about civic engagement, civil discourse, and democracy. Visit democracygroup.org to learn more about our member shows and access deep dive playlists on topics like gerrymandering and money in politics that are curated from across the network. If you like what you heard today, please leave us a rating or review in your podcast app. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Thank you.